All right, thank you very much for having me. Uh, much appreciated. This is the third event that we do after Chicago, uh, Beijing, and now uh, Munich. Happy to be back in Germany. I will give my talk in German now. <laughs> no. No. Nanya is already like, Ooh. Okay, so I'm going to talk about lactation as a biological system. That's something that's really coming up in the last couple of years, uh, that lactation is not just a question of just milk or just the infant. It's really part of a system, and we're starting to study it as a system. And uh, my special research focus is on human milk oligosaccharides. So in the second part of the presentation, I will focus on human milk oligosaccharides really as an example of how we study human milk as a biological system, but also with a caveat to say that, are we there yet? Can we really study human milk as a biological system, or are there really things missing still? Are we still in that um, transition phase between reductionist scientists and uh, systems biologists? Okay, before I get started with systems biology, just to get us grounded again, this is preaching to the choir. We're all, of course, already convinced that human milk is the best thing, but still, I always like to start my presentations with this statement here from the Lancet Breastfeeding Series in 2016 that says that the death of 823,000 children and 20,000 mothers each year could be averted through universal breastfeeding along with economic savings of $300 billion. So uh, just to give a few examples, and again, preaching to the choir, really, uh, every single day we lose about 2,200 children under the age of five to diarrheal disease, infectious disease. We know, on the other hand, that children who receive human milk are less likely to develop these infections, and whether that's GI infections or respiratory infections. And of course, we would love to know how does this work? What is in human milk and what is in the process of breastfeeding that protects infants from these deadly diseases? If we look at preterm infants, about 5% of all very low birth weight infants develop a disease called necrotizing enterocolitis. On the other hand, we know that preterm infants who receive human milk are at a six to tenfold lower risk to develop this disease. And again, the question is, what is in human milk that saves preterm infant lives? It's not just the benefits for the infant that receives human milk at the moment of exposure. There are benefits to life of receiving human milk. We know that infants who receive human milk are at a lower risk to be overweight and develop obesity. The lower risk for diabetes and are potentially smarter. And again, the question is, how does that work? How does human milk, how does breastfeeding make us smarter? And it's not just the baby. We often forget that. Human milk breastfeeding is good for the mother as well. Women who breastfeed and the longer they breastfeed have a lower diabetes risk, lower risk for cardiovascular disease, and lower risk of breast and ovarian cancer. And again, how does that work? What is in the process of breastfeeding? What is in human milk that protects moms as well? So, my premise here of this talk, and you're going to see this throughout this presentation, is that a better understanding of human milk and lactation holds important opportunities to improve maternal and child health. It's not just the infant. So how do we study this? How do we study human milk, and why are we now talking about systems biology and biology uh, uh, um, in general? How do we do this? So how does science try to understand nature? There's two ways to do that. You can either pick a component out of the system that you are studying and use what we call a reductionist approach and really focus just on this component. Let's say one single protein in human milk. So you study individual parts one at a time under static condition. Or you could take a look at the entire system. So you take this individual part put it back into the system where it came from, and now try to study the entire system and that part uh, that is part of the system. So you're studying the behavior and relationships of all the elements in a particular system while it's functioning, so in its dynamic state. That's the definition of systems biology. So that requires systematic manipulation, monitoring and modeling of the system. And I'll guide you through that, what those three M's mean, and why I think that in certain parts of this, we're not quite there to apply that to human milk and lactation. So you can take a look at 
individual milk components with a reductionist approach, let's say lactoferrin, for example. You can take a look at human milk as a biological system. So that's just milk and the components uh, being part of the system. Or you can actually take a look at the mother milk infant triad and use that as your system. So now it's not just milk. Now that milk is part of a system, but that system also includes mom, infant, and the environment around it. So your system now becomes even bigger. And that's really what we're trying to do, right? It's not just milk, it's the milk embedded in this mother milk infant triad. And we see on, on this triad here that there are different factors of the triad. If you just look at mom, so the mo mom side of the system, there is fixed factors, so your mom's genetics, for example. And then there is factors that you can modify. So mom's nutrition, uh, physical activity, and other things that, you know, that part of the system is not fixed, but is modifiable. The same is true on the infant side as well. There's infant genetics and there's other parts of the infant as well that you can potentially modify. This changes over time, so it's highly dynamic. This changes over the course of lactation for sure, but sometimes even within a feed. We know for lipids, for example, they're different in high milk, form milk, so, th so even the milk composition changes and is highly dynamic in a very high resolute uh, um, uh, window of time. And all this doesn't happen in isolation. This triad lives in an environment, in a context that is co-adapting and is embedded in a socioeconomic, cultural, behavioral, and environmental context. Right? So depending on where you are with that triad, you can be somewhere in the NICU, sterile, somewhat sterile environment of a preterm baby with a mom that just had a preterm delivery. That's your system living in that environment. Or you have, let's say, uh, somewhere in rural Bangladesh, uh, a baby term, but with all the other factors around it. So the system depends on where it lives, in which environment. And this is a concept that we published uh, in 2020 in a perspective in science. And I want to highlight this one sentence here of this key figure that says that the mechanistic insights of this triad hold the promise of providing more informative definitions of health status, better predictions of health outcomes, improved recommendations for preventing disease, and new therapeutic targets. And I'll show you a few of those uh, key points here throughout the presentation. And again, all that to improve maternal and child health. So systems biology, studying the behavior of all the elements while they're functioning, and that requires manipulation, monitoring, and modeling. Where are we with that when it comes to human milk and lactation? Let's take a look at manipulation first. So the way this came, across, came, came along was uh, people studying systems biology in, in, uh, in cellular system, for example. There you have your tissue culture, you can manipulate it with high throughput genetics, for example. You can change something in your cell and then see what happens to the system. And in this case, it was just a cell. Can we do that for lactation? Well, you can do that if you study lactation on a cellular or maybe on an animal model where you can specifically manipulate certain things, but quite frankly, that's a bit difficult if you do that in humans. How do you manipulate humans? How do you manipulate the system if you're talking about the mother milk infant triad? It's not that you go in and you know, tweak a few uh, wheels there and see what happens. You can't really do that. So there is limited application to that. You could do an intervention study where you give, for example, multivitamins or something like that and then see how does that change the system. But that's not really a systematic manipulation of the system. We have observational studies where we let nature manipulate, if you want so, uh, with all the different aspects of what uh, the triad goes through. So there is a certain opportunity to study human milk uh, as a, or lactation as a biological system, but it's not quite what we think of systems biology. So we have to keep that first caveat. Monitoring. There's tools to monify uh, or monitor and quantify each part of the system, and they're limited. Right? Think about monitoring the mom, monitoring the infant constantly, uh, and monitoring human milk. And quite frankly, I think that's where we have the biggest problem at this point. We don't have good enough tools to measure the composition of human milk to the point where there was just a paper that came out a few weeks ago that showed that measuring lactose out of all human milk components, milk sugar, depending on which method you use, you get different results. And that's methods that are used in the clinic, used to make uh, um, decisions on how many calories, for example, went into that infant. So depending on what methods you use, you get different results. 
So how can we use a systems biology approach if we don't have the tools at this point to measure something as simple as lactose? And this continues for micronutrients, oligosaccharides, certain proteins, lipids. The tools are just not fully validated to give us accurate results of what is in human milk. So that's a huge gap that we need to fill still as a field. And then modeling. So that, unfor that fortunately, there we can take from other fields, and uh, I think there's a lot of improvement in this field right now, you know, taking AI and all the different stuff that's coming up there right now, that really helps us uh, use computational systems that are developed in other fields and apply that to lactation and human milk. All right, so are we ready to study human milk and lactation with a true systems biology approach? And I would say, no, not really. Right? It sounds fancy, and I think it's the right, uh, right trajectory, but we might not be there. So I think we're really still at the intersection between a reductionist approach and a systems biology approach, because we just don't have the tools available. And I clearly think that we still need to cover the basics, basic things as measuring milk components to really apply a systems biology approach. And this can be done in parallel. So we can improve our methods, but really try to develop uh, tools and, and systems already uh, to study this more from a, from a systems biology approach. All right, so let's get to the second part, and I give you a few examples now from human milk oligosaccharides. So if you take a look at human milk, what is in human milk that makes it so powerful? Like, what, is, what are the components? Main component is water, and we need water. You know, that's, that's important. It's an important ingredient. Uh, we have carbohydrates, mainly lactose, but also oligosaccharides, <coughs> lipids, so that's your triglycerides that are packed in this nice uh, milk fat globule uh, that has a trilayer membrane around it with multiple different functional components, uh, glycolipids, glycoproteins, many, many other things that really make uh, this milk fat globule extremely powerful. Then proteins, different peptides, some of those proteins have protease activity, so they help with the digestion of proteins in human milk in the infant, in the infant's uh, GI tract. And then there's a bunch of other things. There is human cells. There is bacteria in human milk. Human milk is not sterile. We have, of course, vitamins and minerals, hormones, and many, many other things. So there's really this whole plethora of different things that we have in human milk that all have potential bioactivity. And they all don't work in isolation. They all work in context and in concert with each other. So just bring it down even further, reductionist approach. We're bringing it down even further to individual molecule and molecular classes, just looking at macromolecules at this point. Protein, fat, lactose, oligosaccharides. 5 to 15 gram per liter of oligosaccharides. That often exceeds the total amount of protein and is about 100 to 1,000 fold more than what we have in bovine milk, which is the basis of most infant formula. So when it comes to the difference of human milk and infant formula, oligosaccharides is the black and white, or white and black in this case. Right? Lots of oligosaccharides loaded in human milk, not possible or not available in infant formula until recently. So how do these oligosaccharides look like? I'll give you a very brief introduction to human milk oligosaccharides. They're complex sugars. So they're built of five different monosaccharide building blocks, glucose, galactose, N-S2-glucosamine, fucose, and silic acid. And I often compare this with Lego bricks. Right? So let's assume you have five different Lego bricks, five different colors, slightly different shapes. Depending on how you put them together, you get different things. You get either a little car or you get a little plane. And you would agree that cars and planes do different things. Right? And it's the same for oligosaccharides. Depending on how you put those building blocks together, you get very different structures, and their structures determine their function. Just because something is called an oligosaccharide doesn't mean that they're all doing the same thing. Okay, and that's a key take-home message, because we always see, and we see this now on certain products, contains HMO. I was like, which one? Right? And what are you trying to tell me? So all of the oligosaccharides have lactose at the reducing end, our common milk sugar. Lactose gets extended always by disaccharide units. It can be branched, further extended, and that's only using three building blocks at this point. Right? So that's only glucose, galactose, and n 2 glucosamine We call those the neutral, non-fucosylated oligosaccharides. And that's because they're neutral, they don't have a charge, and they don't contain fucose, which is our fourth building block. So if we add fucose now to oligosaccharides, Different linkages, 
we can add fucose to lactose, and we get two fucosolactose and three fucosolactose. And just highlighting out here, oh, here we go, highlighting out two fucosolactose on purpose. It's one of the most abundant human milk oligosaccharides in the milk of most women. However, it's not present in the milk of about 20% of the population. So it's either a lot or not there at all. So keep that in mind for a couple slides down the road. We can add fucose again in different linkages to this growing backbone and we get different structures. Now these are all the neutral but fucosylated oligosaccharides because they contain fucose. So that's four building blocks. Now we add a fifth building block and that's silic acid. Silic acid contains a negative charge, has a carboxyl group, and we can add that to either lactose or to the growing chain of oligosaccharides and then we get the acidic or silylated oligosaccharides because they now contain silic acid. And then there's a fourth group here on the side that's the acidic fucosylated oligosaccharides. That's the oligosaccharides that now contain all five building blocks. Right? No example here. Again, key message here is there's about 150 to 200 different oligosaccharides that we've identified over the years. And not every mom makes the same oligosaccharides in the same concentration. It's highly individualized. And uh, most important from a systems biology approach, even the oligosaccharides all depend on each other. I'm showing this here uh, not to, to go too much into detail, but all these oligosaccharides are either precursors for the next oligosaccharide or substrate for something else. So they're highly intricate. And uh, it's important to study that, that if you find something for one oligosaccharide being elevated, for example, it could be that the precursor is actually diminished. And that is the effect of what you're studying. So it's always important to keep that in mind as well. Example here of the diversity. Uh, this is data from the Canadian Child Cohort, where you see here down on the bottom uh, 1,200 subjects approximately, and the oligosaccharide composition, uh, different oligosaccharides in different colors, and on the left, fairly low concentrations overall, on the right, very high concentrations overall. And this is all taken at three months lactation. Very different from mom to mom. If you take that look at the same data now with relative abundance, you see that it's not just the absolute concentrations, but it's also the relative abundance that's different from mom to mom. So the question is here for human milk oligosaccharides is how do maternal factors drive oligosaccharide composition? Right? So how is this link from mom to breast milk? But also then how is that human milk oligosaccharide composition changing infant health and development? Right? And you could imagine there's uh, the errors going in both directions, really, but we're focusing only on these two axes here. Let's start with the maternal drivers first. What determines the variation of these different oligosaccharides from mom to mom and over time? So bringing this back, where is this all coming from? So we did a study here a few years ago where we looked at the same mom, but now taken samples every day on the left here or taken samples every hour on the right part, and you see that oligosaccharide composition is remarkably constant over a short period of time within the same mom. But top and bottom is two different moms, and you see how different that is between two different moms. Right? So remarkably constant over a short period of time, but very different between different moms. And that's important if you study oligosaccharides, because now you know you get a fairly representative sample depending on, or independent on when you sample during the day or during the week you get a good, good representation. So that's very important. Now that's different if you take a look at a longer course of lactation. So here data that we collected from one month postpartum all the way out to two years. And there you notice that most of the oligosaccharides drop in concentration, but there's a few, like here in panel B and D, where you see that three fucosylactose and three silylactose increase over the course of lactation. And we see this in every single study that we've looked at so far. Independent on which continent, which cohort you look at, you always see that three fucosylactose and three silylactose increase over the course of lactation. If you look at the same data now with relative abundance, three, three fucosylactose actually becomes the most dominant oligosaccharide in the second year of life. And we would love to know why that is. Is there a reason that there is a specific oligosaccharide that needs to be there at a, at a certain developmental stage of that infant? We don't know that. But since we see this over and over and over again, it's either something on the maternal side that changes, or it's something for the infant that needs to change because there is a benefit. Right? So that's something we're still trying to figure out. So 
oligosaccharide composition is highly dynamic. It doesn't change within the feet or during the day, but it certainly changes over the longer course of lactation. Here's a different way to look at oligosaccharide data. This is oligosaccharide data from about 10,000 milk samples. And you see that every dot in this three-dimensional space is the HMO composition in a, in a certain sample. The closer the dots are together, the more similar the oligosaccharide composition. The further apart, the more dissimilar or different the oligosaccharide composition. So these samples were collected mostly in North America, but really there's representation from multiple other countries and continents. And you notice this two clouds there. Right? So there's this left cloud and a larger right cloud. You could almost think as, the, as, as, as if these were two HMO lactotypes, very different oligosaccharide compositions in the left and in the right cloud. And the question is, what is that? So it turns out these are the secretors and the non-secretors. Doesn't mean the non-secretors don't secrete milk. It doesn't mean the non-secretors don't make oligosaccharides. It means they make different oligosaccharides. And where does that come from? So here we did a genome-wide association study related to human milk oligosaccharides. So this is looking at maternal genome and seeing if there are any SNPs, so single nucleotide polymorphisms, that are associated with human milk oligosaccharide composition in her milk. And if you see the y-axis here, that is the p-value on a logarithmic scale. And you see it goes up to almost 120. So that's zero point and then 120 zeros before you get to the one. Extremely significant signal on chromosome 19. So what's on chromosome 19? In fact, there's two signals on the short and the long arm. And just zooming in here in this part, you see there is a signal, very high signal, in a gene that encodes for a protein called FUT2 or Fucosyl transferase 2. Now, what does this enzyme do? It transfers fucose in an alpha-1-2 linkage. So on the top middle here in this, in this graph, you see that FU2 catalyzes the addition of fucose, like this red triangle, in an alpha-1-2 linkage to the terminal galactose. That's the yellow square, uh, yellow circle. Sorry. If there is a SNP, the SNP introduces a premature stop codon and switches off this enzyme completely. So if you have that SNP, you can't make an active FU2, and you can't add fucose in this alpha-1-2 linkage. So you're making very different oligosaccharides in human milk. And I find that quite remarkable. This is one base pair in 3.2 billion base pairs that we have in the human body that changes your milk composition completely. One base pair. And this is different in different parts of the world. You see, in South America, most people are secretors like 1% or 2% or maybe 3% are non-secretors. On the African continent, a lot more non-secretors. We don't know why that is and what the pressure was during evolution to push in one way or the other, but it seems to be important or it was important uh, for something that led to, to survival of one or the other. So we're still trying to understand how oligosaccharides are actually made. We're using GWAS, we're using transcriptomics, HMOmics, and then really to unravel how human milk oligosaccharides are made in the human mammary gland. And that in itself is a biological system, just looking at the oligosaccharides and how they're made and how they're studied. And there's other factors. So there is the fixed genetic factors, and then there is the modifiable factors, for example, nutrition or physical activity. And just showing you here a couple of examples that in animal models, for example, you can see that both nutrition and physical activity change milk oligosaccharide composition. And you can translate that to a certain extent with limitations of human cohorts to humans as well. Okay, so that's the maternal side where we see that there's fixed factors, mostly genetics, uh, but also modifiable factors like nutrition and physical activity that can change uh, this whole system here. And then, of course, the question is, what does this mean for infant health and development? So how do we study that? Uh, we have the entire pipeline, really, from in silico screening all the way over to clinical intervention studies. And that's really what we have available currently to know or to study what oligosaccharides are good for. So there's lots of research interests currently on human milk oligosaccharides. And I'd like to focus on something that is related to what we're focusing on here, and that's the preterm infant in the neonatal intensive care unit. 
and specifically there on necrotizing and colitis. I showed you this in the very beginning. What is NEC? Again, you probably know this much better than me. One of the most common and devastating intestinal disorders in preterm infants. Mean prevalence is uh, about 5 to 10 percent, depending on where you are and depending on how much human milk is used in the unit. Very high mortality rates still. And survivors are often faced with long-term neurological and nutritional complications. Etiology and pathogenesis are likely multifactorial and still poorly understood. Rapid onset, very fulminant progression, limited treatment options, and all that really tells us that ideally we would like to prevent neck instead of having to treat it afterwards. But how do we do that? And that's where the statistics come in. The observation that human milk provides a benefit lowers the risk of preterm infants to develop necrotizing enterocolitis. And the question is, how does this work? What is it? Is it potentially human milk oligosaccharides? So now we're, the system is now in the NICU. Uh, mom just had preterm delivery. Baby is preterm. You know, mat maturity state is very different. So the question was, are human milk oligosaccharides somehow related or, or, or um, important when it comes to the prevention of necrotizing enterocolitis? And we studied this over the last almost 15 years now, starting out in an animal model first, and making this very short before I get kicked off stage here. Uh, we studied this in an animal model first and found that there was indeed one specific oligosaccharide called DSLNT that was responsible of, re of improving survival but also lowering um, uh, patho pathology scores in an animal model. And we were always told, well, this is an animal model, you know, it doesn't really recap really what's happening in the unit with our preterm infants. So we took uh, that criticism and said, well, let's, uh, let's uh, arrange a mother-infant pair cohort and develop a study where we recruited moms and her very low birth weight infants, collected milk samples that went into those infants every second day, analyzed those milk samples for oligosaccharide composition, and then saw who is developing NEC and who is not. And we found that there was indeed a match. Those infants that received more DSLNT were less likely to have necrotizing enterocolitis. We've seen this in a North American cohort, we've seen it in a South African cohort, and we've recently seen that in the UK cohort as well. So three independent cohorts showing us that more DSLNT protects you from necrotizing enterocolitis. So that informs us to move forward with a clinical intervention study using DSLNT, but also helps us study the mechanism in the animal model. And that opens opportunities for therapeutics. So we can now make DSLNT, provide that to the preterm infant, and hopefully reduce the risk of neck even further. Problem is, currently the barrier, if you did that and you wanted to provide DSLNT for the first four weeks of life, it would cost you about $900,000 per baby. So that's not feasible at this point. But we're trying our best to reduce the cost. And our latest projections are that we could potentially offer this molecule at $5 per baby. So that would be a game changer. But at the same time, there is other opportunities. There is the opportunity to develop interventions on the maternal side. So how can we work with mom to increase those protective DSLNT concentrations? We don't have a lot of data on that yet, but that's one of the goals. The other opportunity is to develop diagnostics. Can we actually develop tools to measure DSLNT concentrations either in mom's own milk or in donor milk and then say, ah, you know, this milk is high in DSLNT, perfect to feed this to a preterm infant in the NICU. The problem is currently measuring human milk oligosaccharides, you would send samples either to our lab or a couple of other labs around the world that can do that uh, in a reproducible and robust way. It takes about two weeks to get the data back and by that time your problem in the NICU has been either solved or the baby is dead. So that is not a solution. And we work with our bioengineers here to develop a point of care testing of human milk oligosaccharides. So literally a little device smaller than your cell phone, about the size of this. You drop in some of milk and then within 20 minutes, your Bluetooth enabled device sends your information to your cell phone and tells you how much of the different oligosaccharides are in your milk sample. We're currently working on that for DSLNT. It works fairly well. It's not at the stage where we can mass produce it, but we have first prototypes uh, uh, that it works in very nicely. Okay, so here the goal is to screen, either in the NICU or in the milk bank, identify samples that are lower in DSLNT, adjust our milk pooling strategies, for example, in the milk bank to get higher levels of DSLNT in your final product, 
and then hopefully prevent NEC or reduce NEC further from where we are today. All right, so bringing this sentence back, better predictions of health outcomes. If we measure milk components that are potentially protective, we have a better solution in hand. We can improve recommendations for preventing disease and develop new therapeutic targets, for example, DSLNT. And again, all that to improve maternal child health. So to summarize this, lactation can be viewed as a biological system and studied with a systems biology approach. And that requires systematic manipulation, monitoring, and modeling. And I would argue that the tools to manipulate lactation as a system are limited. Tools to monitor characteristics of the system components are limited, especially when it comes to human milk. And that's one of the biggest caveats at this point. So we may not be ready to study human milk as a biological system, but we're certainly on the way there. When it comes to human milk oligosaccharides, they're the third most abundant component of human milk, highly understudied. Their composition varies greatly between individuals, which is mostly driven by genetics, fixed factors. It's, the, it's remarkably constant over a short period of time, which helps us do cohort studies to get a representative sample, but changes over the long period of time. And we would like to know why oligosaccharide composition changes over time. There's evidence that oligosaccharides may be associated with lower risk uh, for preterm infants to develop neck, as I showed you. There's data on sepsis uh, for infections, improved immunity, and better cognitive outcomes. So it's really, I only showed you the results for necrotizing endocolitis, but there's different other projects and different other uh, studies right now when it comes to the benefits of oligosaccharides. And really this is um, the final sentence here that a mechanistic insight derived from both a reductionist approach and a systems biology approach, uh, hold the promise of providing better predictions for health outcomes, improved recommendations for preventing disease, and new therapeutic targets. So I leave you with this final slide here that that's really what it's all about. It's about improving maternal child health. Thank you very much. <laughs>